Today we are talking about my all-time favourite GCSE topic, space. Let's have a look at the planets. Now, we don't include Pluto, sad face, because it is now classed as a dwarf planet. There are lots of others like it. Um, we just happened to be discovered in the early 20th century. Now, all these different planets, fun fact, can fit between the Earth and the Moon, even though they are absolutely ginormous, some of them. Um, and some of them have their own moons. We call them natural satellites. Jupiter and Saturn have absolutely loads between them. We keep finding more. It's going to probably going to reach 100 soon. Now, bigger than planets, let's look at the scale of space then. So all these planets and moons and asteroids and comets make up the solar system, which is made up of things that, generally speaking, orbit the sun. Obviously, moons orbit planets, um, but the whole system orbits the sun. Now, bigger than that, our solar system is one of many in our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way. So the Milky Way galaxy is made up of approximately 100 billion stars bigger than Milky Way and we have the universe overall which contains many different galaxies lots of different types um, it's like 100 billion probably bigger than that now all different galaxies um, which are in galaxy clusters and things like that but it's a really common mistake to talk about the wrong thing so when we're talking about the universe that's the Big Bang when we talk about planets that's our solar system um, and we'll come on to later when you might want to talk about galaxies in the context of evidence for the Big Bang in part one of this video, uh, we are going to talk about stars mainly. So the sun as an example, but there are actually billions and billions and billions of them. And we're going to look at how they're born, how they live and how they die, usually called the life cycle of stars. So first of all, all stars start off and they form as a nebula, uh, which is a fancy name for a cloud of dust and gas, um, bits of atoms um, that are left over from other solar systems usually. Now that, uh, when they come together, will form a protostar. Then after a protostar has existed for a period of time, it becomes a main sequence star. So we're just doing the stages at the minute. Um, the main sequence star, like our sun, uh, can go one of two ways, depending on if it is a heavy high mass star or if it is a low mass or average star. Okay, so um, a high mass is going to be on the left um, and a kind of low to average mass, i.e. our sun, is going to be on the right. So the mass determines which path it takes. So um, let's do um, our sun first of all. So the low to average mass, uh, after it's been a main sequence star, will become a red giant star. Then it will become a white dwarf star. And as you might be able to guess, red giant is bigger, white dwarf is very small. And after all the radiation is emitted from a white dwarf, it becomes a black dwarf. Now for high mass stars, it's slightly different. Instead of a giant, they are a red supergiant star. Um, and after uh, that stage, you have what's called a supernova. After that stage, you go into two different sections called either a black hole or it forms a neutron star. Now, a lot of people get tricked to GCSE into thinking that's enough to answer a six marker. It's not. You have to be able to not only describe the stages, so that's what I've just done there. That's probably going to be maybe two out of six. You have to be able to explain how to go from one stage to another. So why do these different stages form? Why don't stars stay in the main sequence forever, etc. Okay. So in red around the diagram, I'm going to annotate it, which is a good idea to do with your notes, um, to help explain what the different stages, uh, what happens in them. Okay. So the first one is how does a protostar form? So a nebula or cloud of dust and gas is pulled together by gravity. Even though dust and gas doesn't have much gravity, enough of it gets pulled together over millions of years. Next one, we have our protostar forming. Um, the protostar is kind of like the stage before the star. Um, and this is when if pressure uh, and temperature is high enough uh, for nuclear fusion to occur or to begin. Okay. Now, um, if you need a quick recap on fusion, uh, we'll cover that when we do paper one videos. But essentially, nuclear fusion is when two light nuclei, usually hydrogen, uh, combine together to make helium and it releases energy. But this only happens at high temperatures and pressures, so you need a lot of the matter um, in one place under high gravity for this to begin. Next stage, main sequence star. This comes up a lot of times in exams. This is the stage our sun is in currently. Um, it's been there for about 5 billion years, um, and it will continue to be there for about another 5 billion years or so. So let's look at um, what it's like. Now, it's a very stable um, phase, stable meaning the forces acting on it are balanced or in equilibrium. 
So the forces that are going inwards um, are gravity, gravity pulling everything uh, inwards. Um, the forces outwards are a bit trickier to describe, but they are caused by the thing we just talked about, nuclear fusion, nuclear fusion release, releasing energy. And you'd say a phrase like pressure from nuclear fusion. Different exam uh, mark schemes and examples have slightly different phrases for it, uh, but that's the force that's pushing outwards on the star. Now, if those forces are equal or balanced, then the star stays the same. Basically, that's why our sun doesn't change day on day. It doesn't get bigger or smaller. Now, once that stage is finished, um, we are going to uh, talk about what happens when it goes to the red giant or red supergiant phase. So the red giant, first of all, uh, which is when uh, nuclear fusion um, is hydrogen to helium in main sequence stars. Once the hydrogen runs out, then it is no longer a main sequence star. What will start happening is it starts to fuse heavier and heavier elements. So instead of hydrogen, hydrogen, it might be helium and helium. There might be carbon, it might be oxygen. These heavier elements mean that it expands into a red giant and it has a different color. In the red supergiant phase, this happens to elements all the way up to iron. So iron's quite heavy element, atomic number uh, 29. Um, in a red giant, so like our sun, you get heavier elements, but you won't get up to iron. After this point, all fusion will stop at a certain point for a low to average mass star. And at that point it shrinks back down, becomes a white dwarf. Then even that radiation ceases, it becomes a black dwarf. Now for a supernova, all fusion stops once it gets to iron, but the result uh, is a bit more spectacular. So in a supernova, um, let's think of all the forces acting on a star. If fusion stops, then there's no outward force. So there's just gravity acting. So if there's just gravity acting inwards, what will happen is the star will all of a sudden kind of start to shrink. It will start to get smaller until it gets to a core, really dense core of iron, then it will suddenly kind of rebound and expand outwards. And that's the supernova, an explosion of a star, all expanding outwards, throwing all the elements inside it all across the universe. Now, these elements are heavy elements, um, not just all the way up to iron, um, but you can have uh, heavier ones than iron. What gets formed at the end is a black hole, which is a very, very dense um, uh, object um, which we know uh, surprisingly little about because it's uh, very hard to investigate them but it's a very cutting edge area of physics um, or a neutron star so like I said example of those very heavy elements heavier than iron we are talking about uranium gold tin they were all formed in supernovae a fact to leave you with is that every single atom of gold on this planet in your jewellery, um, wherever you might find it, was made inside an exploding star billions of years ago before the Earth was even around.